Up until 1954, no one in the world had ever run a mile in a time less than four minutes. It just never happened. People had come close, but they just hadn't broke through that four-minute mile until a Brit that's become famous. Uh, you might have seen the film Chariots of Gold, and you see that in 1954, Chariots of Fire, what did I say? Chariots of Gold. Just make it up as you go along, it's all right. Just seeing if you were listening, that's all. <laughs> On May the 6th in 1954, he ran a mile in three minutes, 59.4 seconds. First person ever. It was a phenomenal achievement. He had accomplished and done something that no one else had ever done before. But what's amazing about that story, particularly, is that just 46 days later, someone else broke the four-minute mile. Australian by John Landy. He did it in three minutes and 58 seconds. And you know, since that time where that pioneer did something that people said couldn't be done, there have been many people that have broken that four minute mile. In fact, the record today stands at three minutes and 43.13 seconds. Sometimes when people have got a dream to accomplish something, there are people who have dreams that have literally never been done before. And the responsibility upon them to pioneer and to break through to do something that's not been accomplished previously. It's not just a responsibility that they carry, but their pioneering will mean that a whole lot of other people will look and say, that's possible. That could be done. And then suddenly we get people's belief and faith and convictions rise, and they begin to also venture towards something that people previously have said was impossible. When someone has a dream, they take risks and they create. It creates inspiration that pioneers new ground for others. I've never run a marathon. I've never desired to read, run a marathon. And I don't think I would succeed in running a marathon. But I understand for those that run regularly, I've got some friends that run marathons. And they often talk about something called the wall. I've experienced the wall a few moments on cardiovascular training at the gym where you get to a moment where you think, I just cannot go any further. You're so physically drained, mentally you are convinced that you've reached the end of your road and there just comes the name of the wall because it just feels like it stops you from venturing. And there are so many people in their dream, risk, and create desires that they hit a wall. And they feel, I cannot go any further. And if I'm going to give a subtitle to this, of the, the last one of our series, it's called Don't Quit. Keep going beyond the impossible wall barriers. The marathon wall Runners who manage to keep going and push through that and they work through their stitch and they work through their tiredness and their mental exhaustion. They often find a second wind that comes into them and they keep going and they often get across that line with elation and think, I did it. But the walls seemed to intimidate them, but they kept going. They refused to quit. There are often things that we experience in our lives when we're seeking to venture out with a dream, take a risk and create something that feels like an impossible wall before us. And I love that in Matthew 19, 26, it says this, that with man, there are things that are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. That in your life and in my life, that when you are venturing out, 
in something that is inspired by God and you face that wall, that you have a power and a resource in you that enables you to go beyond that wall and to see the impossible become possible. We're going to look at a story that is part two of one that we looked at some weeks back in this series where I looked at the moment that God called Moses around that burning bush and he said, I've got, a, I've got a dream that I want you to step out and take some risks and to create an opportunity. And now we're going to move forward into the moment where that actually happens. If you turn with me or if you want to look at the screen, if Exodus chapter 5 verse 1 onwards says this, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is this Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then he said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to sacrifice to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave his order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw. But require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they may keep working and pay no attention to lies. Just stop there. So we've got Moses who has had a God encounter to break through and pioneer something new, to go to the most powerful man of the most powerful nation on the face of the earth and saying, let the people that you're oppressing go. But the thing, all these Hebrews, they had... Um, being effectively made slaves in the land of Egypt, and they were the ones that were putting so much of their life into building much of the infrastructure. And so for the Pharaoh to say, okay, go and do that, meant he would have lost his workforce. So this is a big deal. Moses, you remember, had said, I can't do this. I've made mistakes. I've, I haven't got good speech. And God said, I'm going to give your brother Aaron and he's going to come alongside you and speak with you on your behalf, but I will be with you. And Moses said, who shall I say sent me? And he said, God said to him, say, I am has sent you. The great I am, God Almighty, is sending you. So Moses, he leaves the comfort of his life in the desert, looking after sheep, and he takes a risk, and he steps back into Egypt once more the place where he had fled many years previously because he'd murdered someone. And he goes right into the courts of the Pharaoh, the most powerful man of the most powerful nation, and he says, let the people of God go. Now, I would love to say to you that the story at that moment demonstrates that when God calls you to something, that he provides everything that you need and the miracle comes quickly. I would love to say that to you. I would love you to hear me say that when God speaks to you and promises the fulfillment of a word, that you just by taking a simple risk and stepping out will find the answer around the corner. But I can't say that because I don't see many people having that experience. We certainly see in this story that Moses may have gone to this moment full of expectation and faith. In fact, we do find that God had warned him in advance that the Pharaoh's heart was going to become hard. And so Moses was expecting a persistent journey. But there was 
a frustration that was likely to be create, likely to happen when someone steps out with a dream and they take a risk and the creation doesn't go as they hoped. That you often find that there is a persistence required over resistance that is experienced. I found this, that when you step out in the dreams of God, that often there will be people who will question you. Have you ever found that? Have you ever found when you take that venture, when you step out with that courage and that boldness, that there are people who will question what you're doing? Your enemies will question your dream. And there are people who will just get alongside you and they will cynically seek to pull down that dream that is in your life. I've, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised when we see that um, you're okay. We've got a bit of competition, but that's all right. God bless him. I, I don't think any of us have got a surprise when we find that our enemies question our dreams. But I think we're often surprised when our friends question our dream. You ever find that? When people that you thought you were partnering with, people that you know love you and they're for you, when they come alongside you and they begin to unpick that which you're giving yourself for, I want to just give a few bits of guidance to us. First of all, make sure you're not that friend. Make sure that you are not Mr. or Mrs. Cynic. Make sure that you're not the person that makes your life mission a desire to be able to say to someone when it all goes wrong, I told you so. Because some of that is the motivation that we want to be right. We want to look elevated. And so when someone takes a venture of faith and they step out, we want to be the person that expresses concern and caution. So when it goes wrong, we can put our arms around them and look the wise one. Don't be that person. Don't be that friend. But I found that probably the most brutal of questions doesn't come from our enemies or our friends. It comes from our own heart. I found that so often that's where the confidence is most under threat from the condition and the state and the questions of my own heart. And I wonder at this moment when Moses stands before this powerful leader of this powerful nation and says, God says, let my people go. And the Pharaoh says, no. In fact, Moses, let me tell you what I'm going to do. All of these people that you're saying you're caring for, I'm now going to ratchet up the conditions and make it worse for them. Well done, Moses. All the people, the Hebrews, yet yeah, cheer. Well done, Moses. We're now more oppressed than we were. We've now got more difficult conditions. There are more people's lives being taken as a result of this intense slavery that we're experiencing. Well done, Moses. Hey. I'm sure they weren't celebrating him. In fact, we know they weren't. And in the midst of that resistance, there is a need for something in your life and in my life called persistence. Persistence is a continuation of doing something in the direction that you set your face against all the odds that are coming towards you. Persistence is facing that wall on the marathon and saying, I am breaking you. Persistence is standing before the Pharaoh who says, no, and you in your heart say, yes. Persistence is a conviction that greater is the one who's in you and the possibilities that he's going to create than the opposition that you're standing before right now. So persistence, I believe the kingdom of God, I believe the people of the kingdom of God are people who should be persistent. But I want to tell you, this is a very counter-narrative to the world that we live in today. Because we live in a disposable culture, we live in a world that says, hey, are you tired with what you've got? then try something else. Hey, relationships breaking down, start a new one. Hey, don't like your church, find another one. Hey, don't like that worship song, just hang about, there'll be another one following next. Hey, 
We live in a world that has so many opportunities and options. And there are times in that world where people don't cultivate persistence in them because they carry on going for the convenient option of just finding another way forward. And in your life and in my life, kingdom people are called to be persistent people. Let's look at this final word of the theme, dream, risk, create. We know dream is an idea, so it may be in your home, you've got an idea to transform something in your home, you've got the dream, you've maybe articulated the plans, had the ideas, you've sketched out, you've looked at the color schemes, you've got this dream. The risk is maybe saying we're going to start now, we're going to commission the builders, we're going to commission the people to come and do this. And that's a big decision. That's a big moment because you're stepping out of your comfort zone at that moment and you're taking the risk. The word risk is risky. And you step out. But the word create is messy. Because when that starts, when that work begins, your home is less comfortable than it ever was. Your conditions that you live in are more chaotic than they were previously. Because creation often involves mess, often involves a sense of chaos. Of course, we persevere with it because we have confidence that the one that we've commissioned to do the work has the competency to transform the mess, to transform the chaos of the environment, and to bring it to a place of better order than it was previously. But so many people decide do you know what? It's going to be a little bit inconvenient for me to step out into this. And they never step into it. And it's the mess that they know will be created that prevents them. I know some people who, they don't, they don't find it easy to engage in relational fallouts and difficulties. It might be that in your marriage that it's easier just to live with a poor quality marriage than it is to have a dream for a better marriage, to take a risk in creating some channels of moving forward and progressing, and then creating the opportunities to improve things. And what often happens is the people, they think, it's just too messy, it's too difficult, it's too complex, it's too difficult. And they stay with disillusioned dreams that they never step out on. And eventually those marriages become boring, inadequate. They fall so far short of the dream that they had that the marriage begins to crumble. Some people, they don't want the mess of creating the better place. And they stick to what's comfortable. But God wants us to be dreamers, risk takers, and creators, whatever the mess that is created. Do you know there are many moments in our lives, in our Christian walk, where God challenges us on the area of creation. You see, creation is the application moment. If you dared for a moment to think of the number of sermons that you've listened to in your life, the number of sermons you've agreed with, and ask yourself how many of those have absolutely changed your life. As a preacher, it would probably be quite a discouraging thing for you to shout out the answers to that question. But so often we've become conditioned to be hearers of the word and not doers of the word. And God's word calls us not just to agree with him, but to agree with him in stepping out and create, to apply, to initiate, to mobilize. And most of the victories that we experience in our Christian lives come not at the moment of dreaming, not at the moment of making a decision to take a risk, 
Most of the victories we experience come at the application moment. That's when it happens. Scripture that often gets quoted in terms of finances, Malachi 3.10, it says, bring your whole tithe into the storehouse. It says, God says these words, test me in this. Now what God's looking for at that moment is not a resonance for you to say, God, great idea. God, will you provide and will you bless me and will you pour into my life? And Lord, when you do that, I will see that you are a supplier Then I'll step out in you. God says, test me in this and see if I will not open the windows of heaven. See, there's a moment where we create the space for a miracle to happen. Moses was creating that space by confronting the Pharaoh. And in our lives, when we begin to work for reconciliation in relationships, we begin to create the moment where God can come in and bring a miracle. When we step out and we test him in our finances and we trust him, he comes and he shows us that he is able to bring a miracle that's way beyond our expectations. God has a way of being there with a victory at the point and the moment that we trust him, test him, and step out in him. God, I've never met anybody who has ever stepped out in one of those moments and found that God wasn't there. Let me tell you what I have found. I have found that there are many times when people step out in that moment and they don't see the result happen as quick as they hoped would happen. That's what I see. I see people who get a vision for the people of God, just like metaphorically like Moses here. They get a dream and a vision that comes from God. They step out and they take a risk. They step into a context of creating an opportunity. And they say, let my people go. And it doesn't happen. And then they say, didn't work. I meet people. In fact, I've got stories of my own life that are that story. But I find that when people say, actually, God has said this. God has determined this. God will make a way here. I am going to persist in prayer. I'm going to persist in creative opportunities. I'm going to persist in pushing forward the purpose of God in this. And when we do that, I see that people experience the miraculous. It's in persistence. It's in keeping going through the wall. It's not quitting. It's not giving up. It's trusting God with the outcome as well as with the process. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. See, we're not called to give it a go. I, I don't like that term. Oh, just give it a go. Just give it a go. Because it's a bit half-hearted, isn't it? Just have a go. Go on. Just put a little bit speculatively into the opportunity. Don't give it a go. Give it a finishing line. Give it the goal of where you're heading. Don't just say, I'm just going to start this race and see how far I get. Say, I'm going to finish this race. And I'm going to trust that God will be with me every step of the way in order to get me there. Don't give it a go. Give it a finishing line. Moses wasn't going to give it a go with Pharaoh. Moses was commissioned by God to see the people of God freed and released from the oppression of the enemy. I want to introduce some people to you who didn't quit. On the screen, we're going to put a lady called Chasha Soon. She's from Korea. Look at her. She's so happy. Why is she so happy? She took her driving test 950 times before she passed. <laughs> is there anyone in this room who can beat that? She became a bit of a celebrity in South Korea. In fact, she is now being used as a sponsor for some of the car manufacturers in South Korea. 950 times. 
She hit some walls along that way. Literally, I don't know, but metaphorically, there were some walls, I'm sure, that she experienced. What an amazing lady. Well done, Cha Sasun. Yeah, well done. I'm going to show you a picture now of something called the Dream Temple that was, um, or the Castle Ideal it was called. Look at that beautiful place. That was built by a postman. A postman that was out doing his rounds and um, he fell over a stone, a bit of a limestone. And he was a bit annoyed, stopped him doing his round, and he picked the limestone up and he took it home. And he thought, I could make something with this. So he had a plot of land and he put it down and every day on his postman round, he picked up more stones. He found stones, he took them home. And it took him 33 years to build that. Just from stones. Just to start it from a stumbling block became an opportunity. Wives, can you imagine being married to him? <laughs> Where are you off, darling? Just going to finish the temple. 33 years. Ferdinand Cheval, his name was. His wife actually got involved in the venture with him. Finished it towards the latter days of his life. And now, 100 years or so later, people travel from all over the world to see what started out as a stone that tripped up a man. I'm sure that there would have been many moments when he thought, I'm going to give up on this. I'm going to put another man up who's a, a man I know. He was in... Um, my church, and I pastored in Derby with his family. Can we put the picture of Miles Hilton Barber? I'm going to tell you some of the achievements of this man, Miles Hilton Barber. Type them out, because there's quite a lot of them. So, he was a pilot. To, he, he took a 55-day, 21,000-kilometer microflight from London to Sydney, he um, hauled a sledge over 250 miles across the Antarctica. He completed the toughest foot race on Earth, 150 miles across the Sahara Desert. He's climbed 17,500 feet in the Himalayas. He climbing uh, Mount Kilimanjaro and Mont Blanc, Africa and, highest, Africa and Europe's highest mountains. He ran the 11-day ultra marathon race across China from the Gobi Desert to the Great Wall. He completed the coldest marathon on Earth, the Siberian Ice Marathon. That sounds exciting, doesn't it? Um, he, he was competing in the hottest ultramarathon on Earth across Death Valley in California. He crossed the entire Qatar Desert nonstop, day and night, in 78 hours without any sleep. He circumnavigated 38,000 miles around the world using 80 different forms of transport. He set the Malaysian Grand Prix, Grand Prix lap record for a blind driver in a 230 kilometer per hour Lotus, uh, KPH, sorry, Lotus. Do you hear what I said then? Yeah. He's blind? Yeah. He's done all these things, a blind man. He, he wasn't born blind. He was born healthy and lived a very healthy life and was a healthy adult and um, began to discover that he had a a disease that was going to take away his sight and completely lost his sight. He's completely blind, not partially blind, completely blind. And he decided that that stone that was going to be a stumbling block was going to be an opportunity. That there was nothing going to stand between him and adventure. I've only said some of the things that he's done. He has white water rafted down the Zambezi River. He has completed more than 40 skydiving jumps. He's cage dived with great white sharks. And he's done all of these things blind. He's flown a hawk, a hunter, fighter jet as a blind man. There's so much more I could read of the things that he has done. And Miles Hilton Barber now travels the globe telling people, there's no reason why you should stop or quit. There's no reason that should keep you from the adventures that are in your life. That you 
can find a strength and a purpose in your life to move forward. These people didn't quit. Moses, ten times he went back to the Pharaoh. Ten times. I think he hit his wall before the tenth. And he kept going. He persisted. And he saw a breakthrough. When I think of the Apostle Paul that Sean was speaking on last week, and I see a man who experienced shipwrecks, a man who experienced imprisonment, and he kept going. I've just finished the biography last week of Canon Andrew White, otherwise known as the Vicar of Baghdad. And you see that a man who, as in spite of health conditions, a man who was diagnosed in his 30s with multiple sclerosis, a man who has to have treatment virtually every day of his life, is flying all over the globe, bringing peace. He was in his hospital bed in, uh, I think it was in London, and he had a phone call from three different agencies in Israel, all saying, you must come over now, and he was in hospital bed, completely um, sort of affected by his illness, and they said, you, we need you, you must come over. So he discharged himself, got on a flight, and went across to help bring some reconciliation and peace. And I love when I read of people who break through the wall and the barrier and they don't quit and they don't give up and they keep going and they keep persisting and they keep going forward and they keep trusting God and they keep believing that the impossible is possible with God and they keep inspired and they don't give up and they don't quit. What about you? What will your story be at the end of your life? Will it be of someone who, when the going gets tough, you move on to the next thing? Or will it be of someone who learned to be a warrior? Will it be of someone that learned to be persistent in the things of the Lord and to see miracles happen? You know, if Moses had given up a time at the, the ninth occasion, that would have been it. Israelites wouldn't have been freed. Maybe your breakthrough is at the end of a line of persistence in your life. It's important for me just to mention for a few moments as we come to land this in just a few moments' time that there are sometimes occasions where quitting may be the appropriate thing to do. There are some people that sing on X Factor that someone should have told them some time ago <laughs> that their dream is a delusion. Sorry, I'm not being your enemy. I'm not being your friend. I'm not trying to discourage you. You just can't sing for toffee. Find something else to do and stop dreaming of becoming rich quick and finding a simple route to navigate your life and work hard and sort something out in your life. You know, sometimes there are occasions when quitting Maybe the right thing because people are barking up the wrong tree. But I want to just give you four questions that I believe you should ask of your own life before quitting. First one is this. Is the cause that you're giving yourself to a righteous cause? If it isn't, if you're in business and your business is corrupt and it's not righteous, just that you can, we can pray for you all you want, but you need to find righteousness. You need to find truth. You need to find a godly way through this. Is it righteous? You see, I believe that we're called to be kingdom people, that God has not come to match the convenience of our lives and our needs and our circumstance, but God has invited us into his kingdom, and the things he calls us to are as agents of his kingdom. There isn't two levels of Christian, one where there's the minister that has been specially separated for the purposes of God, and then there's everyone else who have just become Christians and now just trying to plod on with life. There is no separation. The kingdom of God, you're either in the kingdom or you're out the kingdom. If you're in the kingdom, your life is Christ's. If you're in the kingdom, you have died to yourself. If you're in the kingdom, your life is no longer your own because you've been bought with a price. If you're in the kingdom, you're now a slave to worship, as the Bible says. If you're in the kingdom, you are totally his. You're not giving it a go. You are immersed in the purposes of God. 
If you're in the kingdom, you're called to be someone who will be a warrior to see the purposes of God established on the face of the earth. If you're in the kingdom, it means when you look at evil, you don't touch and shake your head and say, what a terrible world you live in, but you say, we're going to see the kingdom of God advance against this evil. We're going to see light shine where there's darkness. We're going to see freedom come where there's oppression. We're going to see people liberated. We're going to see broken hearts bound up. We're going to see broken people healed up. We're going to see lives who are lost found. We're going to see people who have no purpose find destiny. If you're a kingdom person, that's the person God's called you to be. And if you come against a wall, if you hit a wall and you say, this is my out, that's not the kingdom. God's kingdom calls us to be warriors, fighters, people with a purpose. People with a destiny. People that will go and square up the Pharaoh and say, you will let God's people go. People who will be determined to see the promise fulfilled. People who will get on their knees before the Lord and say, God, I need a breakthrough in my life right now. And I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. Is your cause righteous? Secondly, is your heart pure? The Lord loves pure heart. And of course, your heart can't be pure by your own attempts and merits. Our hearts are made pure by grace. Do you know one of the most important days in my month I take a day retreat every month and I'm in a privileged position that I can juggle my diary around and I can do this, but I want you to know I'm really busy and it's quite a sacrifice. I want you to know that probably on the very morning that I go off to take a day of devotion and a day of just hanging out with God, that probably I get proportionally more emails that day, more voicemails. I remember I pulled up to Dartmoor a few months ago for one of my day retreats with God, and suddenly my phone went off, and I had seven messages while I was sitting in the car park waiting to go for a walk on Dartmoor Hills. And um, it's sacrificial. But you know, I go to those days, and I have plans, and I have things I want to talk about with God, and things about the church, and God... You know, I'd love your wisdom on this, and you love your thoughts on this. And I find that virtually every time God says, that's really good, Mark, but I've got something else I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about your heart. I want to talk to you, Mark, because as the Scripture says, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. And, you know, I, I try to be a nice person. I try to be full of God, but I'm fighting a heart that's corrupt. And so are you, before you look all judgmental at me. I know I got chariots of gold wrong, and I got the date wrong, and all that stuff, but it's not evidence of a heart that's any worse than yours. We've, we're all fighting a bad heart. And the, and the problem is that we just, we just don't hang out with the Spirit enough to let Him talk to us. We just expect somehow that we can carry on living our normal busy lives and somehow it will all work out, work out. But God wants to talk to us. He wants to get alongside you. You know, one of the things that concerns me a little bit is that we reflect in our services that maybe prayer is just the domain of those who are going through difficult times in their life right now. You know, your life could be going brilliant right now. You could be on the crest of a wave of blessing in every area of your life, and you still need God. You still need Him because your heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. You need God to come and just invade your life. You need the Spirit of God to come and set you alive. Is your heart pure? Before you make any decisions about quitting, I suggest... You take a day to pray and fast and ask God to talk to you about your heart. Thirdly, do respected people believe in me? 
I've already said that sometimes you get your friends and your enemies who dispute with your life. But it, there is good wisdom, biblical wisdom, in having a council of godly people around you. And I find that some people, they keep persisting on, they've never asked anybody for advice. They've never opened up their heart. And sometimes that's because on the previous point, their heart is proud. I need people to speak into my life. And I ensure that I do that regularly. You need people to speak into your life. Why don't you just phone someone up and say, I've got a, a decision I'm making right now. I've got something I'm thinking about. Can we meet for a coffee? I want to just get your view. And start off the coffee by saying, listen, what I'm about to share with you, I want you to say honestly what you think. I won't judge you. I won't, we won't fall out. Just tell me honestly what you think. If you do that, I, fi I find that when I do that, there's such a richness of wisdom that comes into my life. And then finally... Do I still have a peace and a passion for what God's doing? I find that in my life there are two navigation points that determine the purpose and the will of God. One of them is that I have a sense of peace. And it's often completely irrational. And the other one is I have a passion. And again, it's often irrational. And if those things have died and you've spent time praying, I think it's often a good sign that actually God's saying... That's not the dream I've got for you. That's a spiritual thing, not a circumstantial thing. In conclusion, Galatians 6 verse 9 says this. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. As we come to the end of this Dream, Risk, and Create series, I, I, let me just share something personally. Maybe the worship band could come back onto the stage while I'm sharing this. So we're going to sing a, a final song and wait upon you for your contact cards and offering to the Lord. I think I've been a dreamer much of my life. I don't know why. Uh, I, I wasn't exposed to lots of dreams in others as I was growing up. But there's been something that God has done in me that has enabled me to have a, a vision for something that isn't. I, I, I'm incessantly optimistic. I, when, I, when I read statistics that say that the church in the, in the West is in decline, I, I look at it and say... It's going to be an even greater miracle when God changes that. I'm insistently hopeful. I'm insistently uh, believe for a better day. I'm absolutely convinced of it. And that comes, I believe, partly it's partly my nature, but I also on the issue of a church, I look and I see in God's word that he says, Jesus said, I will build my church. And there's no pharaoh, there's no wall, there's no lack of resource that will ever stand against it. When I look at this city, when I look at this region, I, you know, I've got to be honest, I don't see a church of hundreds. I see a church of thousands. And I, I don't just see it in River Church. I see other churches. I sit down for meals with other leaders and we meet up socially. And I, and I, and I pray that their churches will be churches of thousands because this city needs churches of thousands. This nation needs people who will rise up as warriors, kingdom people, and they will not take the disappointment of the Pharaoh saying no and even turning the screw on the conditions and making it harder for them. They will not take that as a discouragement, but they will say, God, you are going to do this. I'm going to let you in something that I've been stirred about the last few months while I've been working on this series. We've only just started talking about it behind the scenes of the leaders. But I, I just beginning to dream about this place being a 24-7 center of prayer and worship. Now, there's nothing particularly special about a building. 
You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. But I just, God is so worthy. And let's face it, our prayer life sucks. Okay, let me personalize it. My prayer life sucks. And yours probably does too. Do you know a few, back at the beginning of September, we had a week of prayer here. It was a call to the church to pray. We didn't have big numbers. Every morning, was it 6, 6.30, 12 of us would gather here and we'd just get on our face before the Lord and we'd just seek His face. The sun would begin to rise as we started to pray. It wasn't big numbers. It wasn't earth shattering. It was never going to make a magazine feature. That Friday at the end of that week, we had a breathe worship night which I've got to be honest, it felt like we could have sung Bar Bar Black Sheep, Have You Any Wool, and the anointing would have been here. Because there was just such a sense of the presence of God. That Sunday, I think it was the first Sunday we used the balcony, if I remember, and it was before we'd even finished preparing it. And there was just such a sense of God's presence. And I began to get stories of people encountering God in a new depth and a new way. And I don't believe it's a, it was an accident that that week happened following a week of prayer. And I begin to think, what would it be like if 24 hours a day we are seeking the face of the Lord throughout the week? I believe we could see even greater miracles happen. I believe, in fact, I believe we won't be able to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go unless we do that. Unless we really get serious of getting on our face before the Lord. So in the new year, we're going to start a new theme called the Devotion Revolution. And we're going to look at what it takes for us to be people devoted in prayer to the Lord. And I don't know where that's going. I don't know how we're going to get there. I don't know how we're going to make it happen. But I believe that what God wants to do it's something that's way beyond us. And if that's going to happen, we need Him. Can't just keep adding team and all those things are good, but it's about what God wants to do.